and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The Night Flight of Mystery If it walks like a duck or quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. All hallmarks of the US interfering in Sri Lankan affairs once again are on display, but we are being told by the empty-headed Colombo liberals that it ain't the case, and they are silent. Why, my dear friends? Because they fought hard to break this country and let their masters succeed. It's also easy when the rest of the country, especially the leaders who should be keeping an eye on possible nefarious activities by foreign powers, are busy fighting to grab power and further their worthless lives of vanity. Is the election the most needed thing in this country right now? To make sense of things, tonight I will speak to the chief incumbent of the Sunetra Mahadevi University College of Will Professor Madhagoda Abete Satero, senior academic researcher at the University of Boston, Dr. Rebecca Ray, Director General of Community Affairs to the President Keithi Thenakon, Executive Director of Pafaral Rohan Hityarachi and former Human Rights Commissioner Dr. Pratibha Mahanamaheva. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. And a very good evening to all. Thank you very much for checking us out once again. Lots to discuss, so let's get right to it. Well, Sri Lanka's prospects of getting its act together and sorting out the mess we are in right now seems to have fallen on deaf ears. No one from the parliament is interested in addressing the economic crisis. However, most of them are interested in using the words economic crisis to further their sorry affairs. Right now, the country is asking for an election, so they say. But is that really the need? Even if we have this local government election, can it change the course of this country? Can it address the economic crisis and provide immediate solutions? On the contrary, it surely can create more chaos. All that the current local government election can do is to give power to perhaps the opposition, which would trigger a much needed general election and soon after a presidential. So instead of fixing this country, we will be engaging in election rhetoric and rallies for many years to come. Right now, instead of addressing the issues that we are facing, like how are we to import oil in the next few months? Can we ensure uninterrupted power supply, just like how the minister promised? Can we bring in the much needed medicine? Can we ensure that the country will not run out of food? All that is seconded to the need to grab power by a very selfish few. And you and I keep rotating in that tomfoolery and no one's there to speak on our behalf. If we weigh in the sorry state of this country's citizens right now, we have a government that says that they are trying to fix the broken system but is interested in following the blueprint the IMF has for us and that will surely break the middle class and wipe out the low income families. We have an opposition whose leader is more interested in reciting fairy tales and making promises we all know will never be kept. We have to give it to him at least, he's providing comic relief. We have a third party who thinks that they have already won. Perhaps they might actually win this time. However, they agree to whatever is needed for them to grab power. They, can't, they can taste the victory right now thanks to the golf face spectacle last year, to which they admitted that it was their party behind the whole theatrics of the so-called people's protest. It was actually JVP supporters protest. Right now, they tend to think this is the time that they will come to power. And then 
on the other side, a racially infused political party hoping to milk the situation to grab their dead leader's aspirations of a broken country and a separate state via the 13th Amendment. We have a certain ambassador who's going around the country hoping to uh, transfer this country into a military base. You saw secret military delegations coming into the country. More on that in a moment. Now, that ambassador is working hard for her nation as she preps for a possible showdown of a country with China. Our youth, supposed to be our future, is, well, not invested in fixing this country, at least at the moment. It doesn't seem like that they care. They're not inspired, they're not motivated, and are living a lumpen life. That is the sorry state of affairs right now. Now, to whom do we turn to fix this country? As I explained, it's not our leaders. We've done that. Perhaps, just perhaps, it's time for us to turn to ourselves. No need to fix the country. Let's start with fixing ourselves and our lives and changing our attitudes towards this nation. Every problem has a solution. So instead of focusing on the problems, let's start focusing on the solutions alone. Right now, the problems we have are solvable, fixable, and for sure correctable. It's just that you and I need to start. So let's start small. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, in the dead of night, on Valentine's Day, the airport tower at the Bandar Naik International Airport receives a message from two military aircraft requesting clearance to land. Whom could they be? Is it a Santa Claus for Valentine's Day kind of a situation? Was it an emergency? Was someone in trouble? Even though it looks like the new Mission Impossible movie's opening plot, the reality seems even more sinister. Now, on the 14th of February 2023, two Boeing C-17 Globemasters, which are heavy-duty military aircraft designed to carry military personnel, equipment, and even bombs, landed at the Bandar Naik International Airport. At that time, we were still determining why these crafts were in Sri Lanka and their purpose. On board, over 20 member delegation from the United States of America. Well, there was no prior announcement of such a visit to Sri Lanka by such a delegation. In fact, the whole visit was tight-lipped as ever. Such a hush-hush affair. Obviously, this piques the curiosity of many around the country. The social media was read in a uh, red with it. Are they here to finalize the deal with uh, to establish a U.S. military base in Sri Lanka? Is the U.S. preparing for a possible showdown with China? Or are they here to take over Trincomalee Harbour? Unfortunately, there wasn't much information on this visit. Now, to understand the possible motives of the visit, we have to see who came on board those flights. According to a media release, after all of them left, issued by the Ministry of Defence, said, that it was, in fact, U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense, Jedediah Royal. The rest of the media release is a typical government release with no other detail, but some PR activity to say that all is well. Now, who is Jedediah Royal? What's his track record? Perhaps if we look into what he has been up to, it might give us a better understanding of why they are here. Now, his recent activity has been tightening relations against China over the Chinese spy balloon shot over the United States. Joining me now is uh, Dan Gouthanamasam from the Data Board to give us an idea as to who Jedediah Royal might be and what exactly his intentions are in Sri Lanka. Dan, good to see you. Now, what have you learned? I know you've been looking into what he has been doing thus far and where he has been uh, doing all these kinds of things. What exactly did you learn? Yes, Mahesh, now I think it's, as you mentioned, it's a bit important to look back because his most recent appointment that you were talking about, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Indo-Pacific area, security affairs for that specific region, was quite recent. Now, that is not what happened, what he was doing or what he was part of before. He was part of the NATO before, and even before that, he was part of overseeing the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, 
we in in that capacity where he was was he was the former deputy director of the defense security cooperation agency which is primarily what works with the people on the ground as in when united states has to go into afghanistan this is the organization that looks into training the afghan mm. civilians and to look into how they can have a partnership what they call on their website is security cooperation now a lot of interesting things there we see that he not only uh, overlooked the withdrawal from afghanistan but also he was the one in charge of when the united when ukraine uh, when the ukraine russia uh, with, with the Ukraine Russia intervention began. So we see that he has a lot of experience in these kind of conflict regions and a lot of import, like we can join a lot of dots, Mahesh, you would see. Exactly. And as you mentioned, we'll just have a look about what he says about China. Uh, Senator, um, we're continuing to make assessments on uh, the Chinese intent for this specific operation, um, and we'll have further to share in the classified setting along the specific intent. Um, I think it would be uh, false to try to characterize this operation as purely a mistake. Um, my understanding, sir, is that the, uh, uh, this is consistent with a broader set of actions China's undertaking to uh, intrude uh, our, our sovereign territory and those of our allies and partners. Mahesh, what we saw there was the exact uh, the, the hearing at the Senate subcommittee about the Chinese spy balloon that has been filling the airways in the United States. We are quite clear about what its intentions are when it comes to China. Indeed, uh, Zanidu, a um, lot of things he has been doing thus far is with regard to the whole uh, uh, military side of things for uh, America, for the United States of America. Once again, what you said was absolutely right. We have to connect the dots because nobody is giving us the information. We spoke to the Ministry of Defense. They said apparently they are going to give us some kind of a statement. They gave us some kind of a statement which had no nothing in it. We ju it just had the names who, as to who came. And then we had, uh, um, you know, we spoke to the, the, I think the airport, right? You spoke to the uh, airport exactly. officials trying to figure out who is here. Nothing. Nothing is there. That is the Amasam at the data board. As always, thank you very much. Now, these overnight mystery uh, visits by the U.S. is never with good intentions. They are fighting hard for their country, while clowns of our own are shaving their behind in order to offer it at the altar for the United States to use it according to their whims. Now, many influential defense analysts worldwide are sounding drums of war, not for Ukraine, but for a possible showdown between China and the United States. We're yet to uh, find out how it will happen, but looking at visits such as this is very evident, even to a second grader, that the United States is taking names of their friends. So, can we milk the rest of this scenario? Well, if we are intelligent enough, we should think in terms of Sri Lanka rather than be a slave once again. For a moment, think if this was a Chinese aircraft that came in the dead of night and went away secretly. I mean, the Colombo, empty-minded liberals and their Twitter rants would blow a fuse. So hard that even Elon Musk would say, calm down, bro. Well, joining me now is former Human Rights Commissioner, Dr. Prithiba Mahana Mehva. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for your t time. Now, apparently we heard that two military flights uh, had come to Sri Lanka carrying the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for a defense-related visit. We are not yet, uh, we haven't been notified as to the exact details of the meeting with the officials here. Now, Doctor, do you think there is a strategic move by the USA to infiltrate uh, the internal affairs of Sri Lanka or perhaps even go further to see whether they can put up a military base here in this country? Mahesh, the whole story is one page of a whole book. Now, when you see USA, they were really supporting to wipe out terrorism in Sri Lanka. I can remember the last stages of the war, there were six to seven ships which were heading for Sri Lanka with arm loaded up ammunition, guns and other things. So before arriving there to Sri Lanka, what USA and the other countries supported Sri Lanka to actually not to enter these ships and most of the ships, uh, uh, information was given to Navy, Air Force and they did the uh, best. And thereafter, we have seen one Chinese uh, submarine came to Sri Lanka, Mahesh. At that time also, India really got upset and India asked from Sri Lanka, what is the reason that the Sri Lanka former president said for fuel purposes? I don't know whether they believe it or not. So likewise, this Asia, one of the best center geopolitics is uh, Sri Lanka. 
And also we have seen Manila in uh, Philippines, they have an Air Force base. But Sri Lanka, Katuna, Aika, near the airport, one of the country having the Air Force base and many countries near a civilian airport, very less, uh, you know, uh, air bases are there. So uh, high top security visitors Sri Lanka, maybe they are really concerned about the you know, latest Taliban uh, and then other fundamentalist uh, terrorist Muslim organizations are there, how they are operating. And uh, specifically the tension between India, China, Sri Lanka. So they may be thinking in future what type of uh, proposals must be best for security. And we cannot forget the MCC is still there, MCC Sri Lanka didn't sign. So maybe for country security, as well as uh, region security, uh, maybe all these things are coming up. For the air base, I don't think uh, immediately they cannot set up because the country security is there with the parliament of Sri Lanka. So people's sovereignty is there, they must decide what. But many countries, you know, how the Iraq uh, war was started with uh, Bahrain. So they set up the base there. So likewise, USA have their strategies. So we have to clearly see what are the new trends coming up. Absolutely. Uh, doctor, how well, uh, how will the current tension between uh, the US and uh, China affect Sri Lanka? Oh, that's a very good question, Mahesh. Look, now the biggest problem in Sri Lanka, rather than geopolitics, geoeconomics. Geoeconomics, Sri Lanka facing a huge financial crisis. So to set up that, that's why we are uh, asking the support from IMF. IMF ready to give the strategic plan, whatever had done is going to pass. Now the biggest issue, even India ready to reconcern of the debt for a long time period, but China only giving uh, two years. So China is not accepting for a longer period of reconstruction of these debts and loans, and they ask only two years, but IMF is not satisfied. Now there is a big problem. So what USA must support us? So USA actually financially, all these loans and debts given by most of the time, uh, uh, China and India. So if USA can support us for some investment and introducing uh, uh, Sri Lanka to new friends and we can get it, but there's a tension going on. So always, even I have seen in Human Rights Council, even the resolution not against uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, country. So China take one side, USA take one side. This is world politics playing a game. So therefore, uh, most of the time India go with the uh, USA base and China already looking in a different development, but most of the Chinese investments are there in the southern harbor and port city. So we can't forget them. But sometimes the USA, some type of information and some type of comments hurt China. So that's why China also coming up, uh, not to mix up this, we will do the best for Sri Lanka. So there is a cold war every time in China, uh, China and USA. But many uh, USA investment, uh, all these are China. You, you go to USA and any, any state, you want to buy something made in China. So therefore, they also have some plans. For most of the loans that you get by China to USA, USA investments are there. Without China, they can't run. And even see any uh, USA uh, state, there is a Chinese market, Chinese dragon shop, China. Uh, every, they have, not only USA, many countries they have, right? So what I want to see, Sri Lanka can negotiate well with USA and China and take these two things into one table, one round table and start discussion rather than giving adverse comment for Sri Lanka. Both countries love Sri Lanka. Both countries want to help Sri Lanka to develop many things, USA from human rights and China also supporting for a long-standing friend in the UNHRC. Indeed, uh, uh, understanding. Uh, doctor, since I have you here, uh, we all know that the UNHRC session is coming. Do you think uh, there is a collective effort by the West to push Sri Lanka to an anti-China position? Uh, Mahesh, uh, this is not on uh, this year. I have seen from 2014 onwards, most of the time, a proposal or a resolution backed by uh, USA, they take with the Western support. But most of the time, China, Russia, Vietnam, Cuba, they coming on one side. This is world policy. Once again, I am telling this. So when West take one stand of human rights for a country and uh, the other side communist bloc. And also Sri Lanka was supported by, don't forget, Arabic 
the country, most of the Arabic countries supported us. Now, what we have to do to win the West, we must have a proper reconciliation plan. We, we had LLRC like that. So, always West asking, we have passed resolution for the last one year, what you have done. So, for that, Sri Lanka parliament having a great duty to do it. It is in the constitution. So, what is our national action plan for human rights? At least our Minister of Foreign Affairs, he has to, he must visit in March, early March, and say this time, so 51, uh, that they have passed a resolution and the resolution is dragging for a long time. They are asking a hybrid, uh, you know, be a hybrid uh, court. And we have seen in Canada, uh, one part, in, uh, without any investigation, they have that so certain uh, uh, diaspora, you know, efforts they supported with the Canada government and Sri Lanka then genocide. So Sri Lanka has to win. Now today you must have a reconciliation plan or a truth and reconciliation commission. I urge the government to appoint and also uh, very recently a report was handed by the for, uh, uh, a sitting Supreme Court honorable judge to last president appointed a commission and to see how we are going to develop this. So take into consideration all I have seen now reconciliation language culture is really coming up in uh, northern province. So we must work hand to hand and we must win the LTT diaspora groups also this time. Otherwise, the resolution track one risk is there. If we go to the Security Council one day, we are facing a big issue. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. That was the former Human Rights Commissioner, Dr. Pratibha Mahana Maheva. Let's take a short commercial break. Soon after, I will speak with Dr. Rebecca Ray from the University of Boston about Sri Lanka's current economic crisis. This is, this is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. everyone this is the state of the nation now i have consistently held the belief that the imf was the wrong move unfortunately all mainstream political parties right now thinks otherwise we are witnessing the victory lap of the imf at this moment most recently we saw the cabinet gathered uh, the draft of the central bank act to limit the printing of money and making the central bank a so-called independent institution independent meaning who exactly will the central bank be serving after that point? The IMF? Well, that sure seems to be the case. Doesn't it sometimes feel like that our government is essentially the mouthpiece for the IMF? We're clearly playing to their tune to secure the bailout money of $2.9 billion and mainstream politics are hell-bent on that being the right course of action with no other alternatives to consider. Now, as a concerned citizen, I have always wanted to consider alternatives and look at economic problems holistically. For that, I'm now joined by a senior academic researcher at the Global Development Policy Center at the University of Boston in the USA, Dr. Rebecca Ray. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your time. Um, doctor, the current situation in Sri Lanka is dire. Sri Lanka is now a nation that has defaulted. We don't seem to have any bilateral investment to pump up the dollars required for the economy to restart. The IMF has also implemented harsh tax, regi uh, tax regimes uh, that seems to kill the middle class. Now, what is your take on Sri Lanka's current situation and what do you think that this nation must do to come out of this current situation? The first thing to remember in this situation is that Sri Lanka is not alone. Across the world, a debt crisis is erupting due to basically two triggers that are outside of the control of debtor nations rising interest rates, very rapidly rising interest rates, and a rising cost of the US dollar. So loans that are in variable interest rates in dollars, as most bonds are, for example, are very rapidly becoming very unaffordable across the entire world. And so it's important for Sri Lanka to remember that it shouldn't have to take 
the punishment for a trigger that is essentially mostly out of its control. Now, we can look at Sri Lanka's previous IMF agreement from 2016 and see the kinds of conditions that are likely to be implemented in a new IMF agreement. That one in 2016 involved, in some years, literally hundreds of billions of rupees cut from the central government budget. And we know what the impact of cuts like that are on economies in crisis. Slower recoveries, slower growth, higher poverty rates, higher inequality that specifically hurts the middle class as public, uh, public employment and public spending is cut. So if there's anything that can be done to avoid those kinds of conditions, it will be very important for Sri Lanka to remember it doesn't have to take this punishment if it can avoid it. Absolutely, absolutely, Doctor. Uh, now, as a country, Sri Lanka is in discussion on bilateral free trade agreements, uh, especially with countries such as India, Singapore, and more importantly, China. Are FTAs a good way to go? And when doing so, what must we be mindful of? FTAs can be useful, particularly for small countries that are heavily economically tied to large neighbors if they can position themselves as an important hub for goods going into those neighbors, uh, for example, for the last stages of manufacturing processes. However, it is so important to get the details right because, for example, FTAs very frequently tie a country's hands and prevent them from pursuing the kind of industrial policy that would actually allow them to get and keep that manufacturing employment. Of course, as you know, Sri Lanka mostly exports low technology goods, whether they're agricultural goods like tea or manufac manufactured goods with low technology like textiles. If Sri Lanka wants to change that fact, it may need to use some of the industrial policies that, for example, China used in its industrialization. So it will be important not to prohibit yourself from pursuing those policies if Sri Lanka wants to move up that value chain, either with new supply chains related to renewable energy and electric vehicles, or simply greater technology in the supply chains where Sri Lanka is already active, like textiles and apparel. Absolutely. Uh, doctor, let's uh, talk uh, more about the China factor. Sri Lanka's current crisis, by the West especially, is blamed on Chinese loans, especially uh, the USA is saying this, although it's not even one-tenth of the external debt that Sri Lanka holds. Now, right now, Sri Lankan authorities are favoring the West and omitting China. Now, is this a prudent move? As you say, China accounts for about 10% of Sri Lanka's public foreign debt. Let's put that in context for a second. Multilateral creditors like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the IMF account for 20%, twice as important as China, and they're not at the table. It's not being seriously discussed right now. Bondholders and private creditors account for 33% of Sri Lanka's foreign public debt. And while they've signed an agreement that says, Yes, we're broadly in support of beginning negotiations. They haven't offered significant suspensions or haircuts yet. Dealing with 10% of the debt simply isn't enough. And as long as creditors are pointing fingers at each other, rather than all coming together to offer actual debt relief, it's not going to fix the problem. And so while it's convenient for the US and China and the Paris Club to focus attention on each other and say that each other should move first because no one wants to take the first haircut, the truth is Sri Lanka can't move forward without the participation of all of these groups. It is important for multilaterals to step up. The chief economist of the World Bank has said so. It's important for bondholders to do more than simply support the general concept of cooperation, although that's a crucial first step. And yes, of course, it's important for China to also participate. But to put the responsibility of a stalled process on 10% of the problem is clearly not going to fix the whole problem. Indeed, uh, makes a lot of sense. And we actually have to have a bigger conversation. Doctor, appreciate your th uh, time. Thank you very much. That was the uh, Senior Academic Researcher at the Global Development Policy Center at the University of Boston in the United States, Dr. Brebe Kabre. We will take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.
this is the state of the nation are we going for an election it looks like uh, it might not happen due to the unavailability of funds at least that's what the government says now in my op- opinion i too feel that the, this local government election is not as vital as what the sjb and the jvp are trying to make it to be now, if we can go for a general election now that could at least make an impact for the buck we spent tonight i have a bigger conundrum after 2016 when we went to the imf i think for the 16th time the same situation that is occurring now happened and at that time if your amnesia infused brains have forgotten the current government in power the sri lanka budjana peramuna led by former president mahind rajapaksa began huge rounds of protest against the implementation of imf led proposals basically against the high cost of living high taxes high commodity prices and unbearable cost from every corner Remember how they started from Rugegoda and made their way to the golf is green? Remember how they fought for Sri Lanka's agenda? Not allowing foreign powers to interfere, ensuring that you have a voice and fought hard for you. Now, when the same level of economic suppression is occurring, who's fighting for you now? Not the SLPP, they too are now on board with all things they fought against. In fact, they are leading from the front to squeeze you more simply by listening to the organizations they detested back in 2016. So whom do we have now? Podujana Peramuna came to power with the support of the nationalistic force on the assurance that they would correct all historical mistakes. But obviously they betrayed the nationalistic forces and now doing the right opposite of the of what they promised the nation merely for their survival in such a context it is true that nationalistic forces seems to be weak at this juncture yet they are trying to overcome the psychological barrier created by the enemies of our motherland through out of history we have overcome such difficult times i am sure and i hope that nationalistic forces will revive itself and stand by the country with the blessings of the maha sangha Well, that was uh, Venerable Professor Madhaguda Abedi Satero, the chief incumbent of the Sunetra Mahadevi University College, basically explaining who you have right now. The nationalistic camp seems to have taken a hit. So now everyone wants an election, but the government says they don't have the money. So we are at an impasse. What are we going to do? Giving this economic crisis, they are going to postpone elections but there is no legal uh, provisions for them to postpone so if we allow any government to postpone uh, elections whatever the elections without any legal framework or legal provisions so it will be a bad practice we know the government we know we have a we have a economic crisis we are very challenging we are facing very challenging period now but at the same time government spent a lot of money for unnecessary things even in the independent day they spent a lot of money and they are appointing the cabinet ministers likewise there are several other expenses they have made there's no big change uh, so our demand is or our rather our request is government to uh, follow the constitution in this country and follow the elections act in this country so if they are not doing that that is they are failure so if they can't manage 10 billion so that is half day expenses for the country half day expenses for the country so less than the 1% of this government budget for to the 2023 if they if they can't manage that amount what is the point to uh, run the country rule the country if they can't manage even the president or a secretary of the finance so if they can't manage this small amount or if they can't allocate this small amount uh, for elections i think that's their failure so no 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 point just to discuss about this matter uh, that is they are they are duty bound 
the Secretary of Finance as well as the President. And also, we I wanted to highlight this is this money allocated by the Parliament. So they are the they are the authority. The Parliament do have authority to allocate money for uh, annually for various uh, ministries. So they are the uh, the they are the people who has that power. So they allocate money. Now, the secretary has to release that money based on the the budget. Well, that was the executive director of Pafrel, Rohan Hitiarich, explaining as to what we can do. Well, what's funny to me uh, is the the statement: "We must at all times uphold the constitution." That's the go-to line of the Colombo liberals these days. We look at social media; it's it's flooded with that that particular line. We have to uphold the constitution. The last year, they told us to burn the constitution while raping Lady Liberty in broad daylight. They openly called to violate the constitution and said that they would vouch for criminals once they were taken to court. The law fraternity of this country clapped and celebrated when wrongdoers were released on bail. They didn't care about upholding the constitution at that time. If we actually upheld the constitution, then we wouldn't have this the, the shame of being the nation that chased an elected leader through thuggery. If these so-called bozos are for real, then they would have used a legal way of chasing a president, a presidential election. Joining me now is the Director General of Community Affairs for the Office of the President, Keith Thendakon. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Uh, 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 Mr. Keith Thendakon was also the former Executive Director of the Campaign for Free and Fair Elections, if you remember, it's CAFE. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tenekon, for your time. We hear from the government consistently that gathering funds to hold an election is challenging. Now, what is your view about the election? I mean, according to the constitution, we have to have the elections. We have, we must have a country must have free and fair elections, and the government always uh, in line with that. There's no contradiction whatsoever with uh, holding the free and fair elections. But uh, we are having, we are facing uh, very big challenges these days, economically and uh, financially, to have a very uh, uh, good uh, service to the people when it comes to the health, education, paying salaries, and all that. So whenever we are going to have the free and fair elections, there must be adequate uh, and in-line parallel uh, measures has to be taken place. The priorities has to be identified. And uh, our priorities at the moment, we were the country, we didn't have 30 in our electricity and we didn't, uh, there were four queues and all that. Everyone knows the hardship we have went through without uh, proper medicine and all that. So we are gradually coming out of that uh, scenario we are coming out of that uh, crisis at the moment now we are the farmers are getting better pricing the prices has gone down when it comes to the dal and sugar and the other things imported and uh, we have uh, managed uh, with the qr uh, for the fuel we don't see a huge oh what what there's no uh, fuel queues whatsoever now the fisheries industry is coming into play and uh, the, with that the prices has gone down so basically, the, we, are, our, we have the government has chosen their priorities, and in line with that, we are we need another uh, maybe three four months to get uh, all of this because we are in the age of uh, finalizing the IMF uh, loans and all that. So we are in a good track. So within uh, with, within very period uh, short period of time, we are in the right track to have a have a have a good election. Indeed. Now, Mr. Thanakon, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, instead of a local government election, why not hold a parliamentary election? Because that will give the power back to the people to decide on the fate of, of this nation. What do you think about that? I mean, this was widely spoken and discussed during the last uh, six, seven months. Uh, why not go for a uh, parliamentary elections? Yes, according to the Sri Lankan constitution, presidential elections parliamentary elections and the referendums are the universal franchise sort of quoted uh, scenario 
and we everyone admits it and th there were some uh, people concerning that the present government the present government plus the present parliament is not a uh, did not showcase uh, the people's wishes and inspirations at the moment so that part is also they are and uh, maybe some people are now uh, demanding or uh, uh, asking for a presidential election uh, instead of the local elections. And uh, we were very much overdue with the uh, uh, provincial elections also. So with that thing, yes, it is a possibility. And if everyone agrees on that scenario, maybe within no time, maybe by end of this year, we can have either presidential or a parliamentary election. And I think in pers in personal, I, I, I feel the same. To have a presidential or the parliamentary election is the best scenario so we can have a fresh start. But before that, country's priorities has to be addressed. The people should get food, medicine, education, and the very basics. And IMF deal has to be closed. And then only we can have a proper management with the finance and getting the important essential foods and everything to the country is the need of the Arab. Indeed. Uh, thank you. That was the former executive director of the Campaign for Free and Fair Election, Mr. Th uh, Keithy Thinakon. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. I'll be back with a closer. Well, as we end the show tonight, I want to share this parallel that I have been seeing between social media and the situation in Sri Lanka. Now, if you have followed the conversation about social media and watched some of the documentaries such as The Social Dilemma, you would know that the creators of these networks have clearly lost control. However, unlike in other instances where losing control would be damaging, the creators are profiting quite massively from this loss so much so they want to lose more and more control and have you glued to your screens for as long as possible. And despite them wanting you to be glued to your screens, these social media site owners wouldn't allow their kids to use these products. They know that behind the screens of a four-year-old, five-year-old, or even a teenager, or even you, are thousands of engineers following their moves and collecting data. Now apply that to how the IMF and the US treat Sri Lanka. Did the United States achieve this level of economic development by hiking taxes, killing local industries? Has the IMF looked into the historical accounts of the United Kingdom and whether the initial policies including anything that was being pushed on Sri Lanka, granted that the UK was the kingpin of colonization? Now all these countries were once an emerging economy. The IMF needs to ask whether Robert Walpole, the first Chancellor of the Treasury and later the Prime Minister of the UK, or Alexander Hamilton, the founding father of the United States, would condone what they are doing to us right now. I speak of the IMF as if they are an inanimate object. No, the IMF has real people working behind it. So my confusion is why cannot these people, these organizations from the best universities in the whole world recognize that what they are doing is wrong and harmful to countries like ours. Sometimes I wonder whether they already know and yet continue because their loyalty is to their country and not to us. I'm not asking for fairness. Sri Lanka knows it can never be awarded fairness, but rather fight for it. And we have fought for it. And I know if we have to do it again, the real people in this country, the nationalists, are prepared to do it again. I urge you tonight not to lose that hope. On a programming note, make sure you listen to our podcast, which is released weekly, a State of the Nation podcast available on Apple Podcast and Spotify. 
I'm Mahesh Johnny from all of us at Other Than 24. Have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next time.